Hey, what is going on, family? God bless you on this beautiful morning, Saturday, March 20th. Yes, it has been a year since a pandemic hit us, well, here in the States at least, where we uh, completely shut down. But the Lord has been good. The Lord has been faithful to his promises. And today we can say that until today, until this day, that God has been good and that God has been faithful to us. I hope that wherever you are in, wherever you are at, that the Lord may bless you, that you may be enjoying His beautiful blessings, uh, not only you, but also in your families as well. Today, we're going to be talking about revival. Revival, and it's perhaps one of the hardest sermons I have ever written like this week I spent time you know writing two pages and then I would delete them and then I wrote another two pages and I deleted them again and uh, I think it's one of those messages that are hard to preach but that it must be preached and I am convinced that these messages are not that these words are not mine and that they are from God specific folks to specific people who are in need of of revival. I don't know if you are in need of revival. I don't know if your family is in need of revival. I don't know if your church is in need of revival, but if so, you need to listen to this message. So be an evangelist right now and share this link, share it on your page, share it to somebody, send it. And I know, because I know it will be a blessing. want to give a shout out to Pastor John Molina, Uh, Claudia Ochaeta, Elizabeth Campos, Romulo Piña, Mariana Zamora, uh, Brother Daniel Chavez, yes, Lovelyn Mendes, God bless you guys, Lily Perez, Uke Lucky, Annette and Justin Tonga, my beautiful wife, Jared, Vanessa, Moinedo, my cousin from uh, Guatemala, yes, she watches us, Olvido Chavez, God bless you, Olvido, Camilo, Joeli, Pastor Tina, Tina, Carriger, I hope that you're doing well. Pastor Catherine, yes. Carmen, Isabel, and Pastor John Arana. They are some of the folks who watches, uh, the who watch these videos, these messages on a weekly basis. So God bless you guys. And after this short video, we'll jump in into our message today. Don't go. Be an evangelist. Send it somebody. Today, we start a series called Higher Ground, Priceless Dust, because revival starts with brokenness. The book of Micah chapter 4 verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his way, and we shall walk in his path. Mm. For out of Zion he shall, she shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but... I want to go to the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to dwell in the presence of the Lord for the rest of eternity. Now, these verses says that the house of the Lord is going to be established on a mountain. And at one point, everyone says, hey, let's go to the mountain of the Lord. Now, let me ask you something. Do you like climbing mountains? If I was to say to you today, hey, let's go and climb a mountain, would you go? I think many of us would think about it and probably say no, because climbing mountains is not easy. It takes time and preparation. We don't like the work that it takes to go up a mountain, but we all like to be on top of it, right? Whether that is in your professional career, personal life, or spiritual life, today, We are starting a series called Higher Ground 
because I am convinced that God is calling us to a mountain. Today is part one of this series called Higher Ground. And today's message is about revival. And revival meets, revival starts with brokenness. All right? And in today's message, we'll, we'll, we'll see where the call of God to higher ground starts. In her book, Daring to Live by Every Word, Mer- Melody Mason writes about Carrie Ten Boom. Along with her family, she helped save the lives of more than 800 Jews during the world Nazi Holocaust of World War II. And as a result of her family's underground work in Holland, the entire family was arrested and sent to Ravensbrück, one of the most brutal concentration camps in all of Germany. Thousands died there. By the time Carrie was miraculously released from the concentration camp in December of 1944, all of her closest family members had died while in prison. However, instead of nursing her wounds or growing bitter, Carrie went on to spend the remaining years of her life traveling the world, sharing the love of Jesus. Carrie was known and loved for her compassion and her sweet spirit of grace and humility, and many were brought to Jesus by her testimony. Yet, she was still very human, just like you and me, right? One time, while traveling in Cuba, Carrie shared how she had been struggling sitting through a long evening of meetings. She had just given a message about the love of God and then had to wait on the platform while two more men shared lengthy presentations. It was very hot and humid. Pesky bugs were everywhere, and it was getting late. Carrie was tired, and her patience was wearing out. She was, her patience was wearing thin as the last speaker began to make a lengthy appeal. Surely no one is in the mood to do anything but to go home, Carrie grumbled to herself. I hope that no one comes forward. I'm aching for my bed, she said. But to her great surprise, many people began coming forward, responding to the call. Some had tears in their eyes, and suddenly Carrie recognized the selfishness of her heart. Here she had hope people would not give their life to Jesus that night because she was simply tired, hot, and weary. Immediately she confessed her sin to God and asked His forgiveness. And she got up to pray with those who had come forward. The next day, Carrie was asked to speak at a large church in an upper-class area of Havana. Many prominent and affluent people were present. As she came into church that morning, they handed her the program booklet that contained her flowery introduction. It read something along the lines of, Carrie Ten Boom is a most popular world evangelist. She is tireless and completely selfless in her absolute dedication to the cause of the gospel. And as she read the intro, her heart sank. Oh Lord, she prayed, if only these people knew who the real Carrie Ten Boom is, they would not have come to hear me speak this morning. And then she heard a voice saying, why don't you tell them who the real Carrie is, the Holy Spirit answered. Immediately, Carrie began to protest, but Lord, if I tell them, what if they reject me? Again, she heard the soft but firm voice, can I bless a lie? So that morning, Carrie opened her heart and told her audience the truth. And as a result, many hearts were broken and the foundation for genuine revival was laid. Mm. The foundation of genuine revival was laid. Roy Hessian writes, to be broken is the beginning of revival. It is painful. It is humiliating. But it is the only way. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of resources out there on how to be broken 
It's not as if you can look on Amazon and find a selection of books on how to mourn and weep over your sins or on how to humble yourself. Besides, who really wants to be broken, right? Our culture is obsessed with being whole and feeling good. This side, this, this, this drive affects, uh, affects even the way we view the Christian life. We want a painless Pentecost. We want a laughing revival, right? We want a, a, a resurrection without the grave. We want life without experiencing death. We want a crown without going by the way of the cross. But in God's economy, dear brothers and dear sisters, the way up is down. You and I will never meet God in revival until we first meet him in brokenness. There was a man in the Bible who needed spiritual revival. He probably didn't know it, but God did. The Bible says that it was the time that kings used to go out in wars But King David stayed back to enjoy the beauty of the city. King David had come a long way, you know. He had defeated wild beasts, giants, and entire armies. He had won the hearts of Judah and eventually crowned also the king of the entire nation of Israel. People believed in him. People followed him. People respected him. He was a loved king. But after all of these successes, he came to a point where he needed revival. And when he sinned with that girl who was bathing, he he did everything and anything to cover it up. So he called the husband so everyone would think that the baby was his. One sin led to him to another and another and another until he finished being a murderer. He ended up being a murderer. Surely King David needed revival, but revival is met in brokenness, and nobody likes brokenness because it is painful and humiliating. We can hide our sins, you know. We can hide our sins from the people, but we can never hide our sins from God. David and Kerry had one thing in common, and that they were that they were both serving a living God, but they both wanted to hide their sin. We can continue leading a life where we fool others, but we can never fool God. We can continue running away from brokenness, but eventually it'll catch up to us. Therefore, finally, when King David is confronted about his sin, he has no other choice but to face the painful and humiliating brokenness he had been running away from. And he writes Psalm chapter 51. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it. In Psalm chapter 51, he writes some of the most profound repentance prayers I have ever read. And the Bible says the following, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge behold i was brought forth in iniquity and in and in sin my mother conceived me behold you desire truth in the inward parts in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom perch me with hyssop and i shall be clean Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Mercy. Who has broken? He has broken. I'm going to read that again. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And then he says in verse 10, I love verse 10. 
Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressions your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Listen to this, verse 16, very important. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. Mm. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Mm. Brokenness is truly the most sacred offering and sacrifice we can give to God. Notice here that David tried to run away from that. And he knew that his sins were not going to only go away with a burnt offering, with good deeds. And he's like, otherwise I would have done that. That is why David says in, in verse 17 that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. David realizes, realizes that he needs revival in his life. And that's why his soul is crushed and his heart is broken because he had sinned against God. Burnt offerings were very popular in the Old Testament. But burnt offerings to the Lord were designed to give thanks to the Lord for his blessings and for his forgiveness. And it seems that people eventually forgot this and started giving burnt offerings to the Lord to merely please Him. But the Lord offerings were designed, but I'm sorry, but the burnt offerings were designed to give after they had given their hearts to the Lord. In Isaiah chapter one, there's a verse, there's some verses, very strong verses. I want you, I want us to go there. Go ahead and open your Bible in the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. I want us to go there right now. Isaiah, chapter 1. And we're going to start reading from verse 1. All right. It's after Song of Solomon, Isaiah, chapter 1. And look at what the Bible says. We're going to start reading actually from verse 11. Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, Mm. Who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. Mercy. And look at this. To the new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meaning. Your new moons... And your appointed feast, my soul hates mercy. Mm. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. Wow. Look, we usually don't hear the Lord speaking in this manner. The majority of my sermons are about the loving God that we serve. Nonetheless, our loving God also hates, despises, has wrath, 
and rebukes his own children. To me, that is hard sometimes to rebuke somebody. And this rebuke is hard to face. That's why Carrie didn't want to confess her sins. That's why David tried everything he could to hide his sins. We often ignore rebuke because it is painful and humiliating. Rebuke hits us where where it hurts, y'all. And that is in our pride. Rebuke stops us from blaming others of the things that go wrong. Rebuke tells you to stop blaming Joe Biden. Stop blaming Donald Trump. Stop blaming racism on white people. Stop blaming, stop playing the victim and recognizing your own sin. As a church and children of God, we are perhaps as divided as we could ever be. Some want to reopen church and some are against it. Some want to wear masks and others refuse to do so. Some defend the GOP like it was the GOD. Stop it. The problem is not the pastor. There is no need to be looking at the pastor's Facebook account, get together to talk about what he has posted, and then choosing a representative to go and ask for explanations. I have been approached several times by church members to give account for something that they didn't like. The problem is not the pastor. The problem is spiritual. The problem is not that you watch pornography. The problem is spiritual. The problem is not that you masturbate. The problem is spiritual. The problem is not that you steal money from time to time. The problem is spiritual. The problem is not the beer you drink. The problem is spiritual. The problem is not our government. The problem is spiritual. The problem is not your spouse. The problem is spiritual. The problem are not your co-workers. The problem is spiritual. The problem are not your co-workers. The problem is spiritual. Our church's problem is not that the lack of a building. The problem is spiritual. Our church's problem is not money. The problem is spiritual. Our church's problem is not COVID-19. The problem is spiritual. And I can see with all assurance that our church needs revival. Otherwise, we'll continue dying. Therefore, I wonder if we'll have the courage and the humility to recognize our need for revival and meet God in brokenness. God's rebuke is strong. God's rebuke is uncomfortable. If you are feeling uncomfortable right now because of the words that I'm speaking, then God is rebuking you. But notice this, that after God's strong and uncomfortable rebuke, He tells you in verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall lead the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. (laughs) I am not speaking my own words here tonight, my brother and my sister, but I am speaking God's word. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, it says, the word of God. Stop playing Christian with God. Stop giving your worthless sacrifices. He does not want them. He wants your heart. We need revival, but nobody likes revival because it's painful and humiliating. But it's the only way. That's why Philippians says that his power is perfected in our weakness. If you look up the verb contrite, the word that appears in Psalm 51, 17, you'll find that it comes from the Hebrew word daka, which means to crumble, which means to beat in pieces, to break, to crush the powder, to dust, to utterly destroy. And I think that oftentimes that's exactly what he wants us to do with our hearts because it is with dust that he creates magnificent miracles. He uses dust to create humanity. And he became dust 
to save humanity. On December 4th, 2017, 400 musicians gather in the 23rd Street Armory of Philadelphia to perform symphony for a broken orchestra by David Lang. The orchestra included amateurs, professionals, and even members of the steroid Philadelphia Orchestra. The youngest performer was a nine-year-old cellist, the oldest an 82-year-old oboist. It might have been the most diverse orchestra in America. The 400 brought with them broken instruments, a trumpet held together with blue painter's tape, a violin with no A-string, a bow that had lost most of its hair, a cello carried in multiple pieces. You see, the government had cut funding for music programs in public schools, and many school instruments fell into this, this, this repair. But Lang made something beautiful of them. As the musical piece opened, many of the instruments were silent, but gradually they found their voices. While a trumpet might not be capable of sound, the keys could tap a rhythm. The scraping of a bow over the silhouette of a violin body could add an unusual element. At one point, a cellist made noise by turning a stringless peg. As the 40-minute symphony progressed, the instruments roared to life. Some musicians struggled, like the clarinet, who could get out only short spurts of sound, and a French, a French horn player who kept losing his mouthpiece. But together, the orchestra produced rich harmony. The music was playful and joyous, as the performance would down, each section bowed out one by one until all remained was the humble squeal of a broken clarinet. You see, friend, in the church, each broken instrument adds its own voice to, its, to the symphony. The best that some can do is simply tap or squeak, but with each other, the orchestra produces a joyful song of praise under the hand of the director. God is calling us to higher ground today. The first step to it is to it is recognizing that we need revival. We need revival in brokenness. True brokenness is a moment by moment lifestyle of agreeing with God about the true condition of my heart and life. Not as everyone else thinks of it but as he knows it to be. Brokenness is the shattering of my self-will, the absolute surrender of my will to the will of God. The past 12 months have been extremely difficult for so many of us. Some have gotten cold in the spiritual walk with God. Some have gotten distant. Some have gotten very good at hiding their sin like David. But sooner or later, you're going to have to meet with Samuel. And the question is, will you be willing to go through brokenness despite the fact that it is painful and humiliating? Are you willing to go through brokenness even though it's painful and humiliating? I want to finish this message with a psalm found in six, Psalm 69, verse 30 and 33. Psalm 69, verse 30 and 33 says this, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble, who? The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. 
I know that the Lord speak to me, spoke to me through these words and through this message. And I know that God is speaking to you today. What's going to be? Will you be a David who will continue to, to continue to hide their sins as much as they can? Will you run away from brokenness? Will you continue to, to, to say the guys on the news, those are the bad guys? Or will you say, man, I am a bad guy and I need to stop hiding my sins? Will you continue to blame other people, entities and companies and governments and whatever it is? Or will you face Samuel? In rebuking your sin, will you face the Lord and say, Father, I am so sorry, Lord, forgive me, Lord. And will you meet brokenness if you are willing to do that? Let me tell you today that God is willing to do something amazing in your life. Through brokenness, if you want revival, if you're going to take anything from this message is this. Revival begins with brokenness. Stop playing the hard. Stop playing hard. Stop playing Christian. And come face to face with your Lord in brokenness so that you may experience revival. I don't know if God is speaking to you today, but I think he does. And I don't know what you're going to do. But I hope that you do the right thing. I hope that you are able to see amazing grace and receive amazing grace. I hope that today you can stop running away. Can I pray with you? Father in heaven... This is so hard, Lord, because of our pride, because of our selfishness, because of all of the things, because of all the brokenness in us, Lord, we continue running away. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you may give us the courage, you may give us the strength, you may give us, Father, the courage, Lord, and the love face you in brokenness that you may start a revival in our hearts father forgive us for my sins forgive us for our sins lord i pray for this person who is watching right now wherever that person is father meet that person where he or where she is lord rebuke us father because we need it rebuke us lord because you love us pray for our spiritual lives let's pray for all of these little problems that we have lord little or big teach us remind us the problem are not not merely those things but the problem is our spiritual lives father in the name of jesus i pray for revival upon our lives revival upon upon our church revival so that you may come back for the second time lord in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. I hope that you're best blessed. I hope that you can share this message with somebody. I hope that you can experience revival and that you may no longer be afraid of brokenness. God bless you. Higher ground. Come to higher ground. We'll see you next week for part two. God bless.